You're listening to Graveyard Show Classic. 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 Good evening, friends of the undead. I am the Deacon of Darkness, the posthumous pimp. Freak Show! And I am the Diva of Dismemberment, Mistress of the Blade, June the Meat Cleaver, from the Bordello of Horror. You're getting your freak on with the caretaker on the Graveyard Show. Step into the graveyard with the caretaker at graveyardshow.com. That is graveyardshow.com. Podcast number 41, October 22nd, 2009. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Graveyard Show. I'm your host, The Undertaker, and The Graveyard is open. Tonight I'll be talking with Kevin Tenney, the director of Witchboard, Night of the Demons, and more. You'll hear how Kevin's Emmy Award-winning student project at USC and graduate film project launched him into his early directorial career and so much more. Before we get started, I'd like to remind you that our friends at Splattercast have dedicated this week's podcast to the fight against breast cancer. Many from the horror community have gotten behind this show, including The Caretaker. And I hope you'll join us to learn about the prevention and where you can make a donation for the cause if you so choose. As you'll hear on the Splattercast, breast cancer has affected The Caretaker's family and the reason for his temporary departure from the graveyard. Now this is a real good thing these guys are doing, so please check out the Splattercast at deadlantern.com for more details on how you can help fight breast cancer. Now, as you can hear, the workers are breaking ground for tonight's guest. Director, writer, producer, and actor, Kevin Tenney. Tonight's guest, Kevin Tenney, got his start when he was accepted to the cinema television department of the University of Southern California, where only the top 5% of students were given the opportunity to direct either a senior project or a graduate film. Kevin was, and still is, the only student in the university's history to direct one of each. Kevin went on to direct such films as Witchboard, Night of the Demons, Tick Tock, and most recently Bigfoot. Kevin, welcome to the graveyard. Well, thank you for having me. Now, let's start right at the beginning, and let's talk okay. a little bit about those projects that you did at, uh, as a student at USC. What were those all about? How did those help launch your career as well? Well, the undergraduate film... Uh, was called War Games and it came out before the feature film War Games Um, and it was about a Vietnam vet who has become a police officer and is involved in a shooting incident and is he's up before the shooting review board talking about um, telling them about the shooting incident he keeps having flashbacks to a similar incident he was in back in Vietnam and realizes that the way he reacted as a police officer was directly effect, attributed um, to the fact, uh, the way he reacted to an, the earlier situation when he was in Vietnam. And anyway, that ended up uh, um, winning an Emmy for the best uh, student production of that year. Nice. And um, then my graduate film was a dark comedy about a lawyer who um, ends up representing a um, homeless man who was at the scene of a political assassination and uh, in the course of the pretrial hearing he declares to the open court that he is actually uh, Jesus Christ returned for the Armageddon and the rapture Wow! and, <laughs> <laughs> and this lawyer and that film when uh, USC when you do a, a project like that it's shot on 16 millimeter color film with sync sound and then they have a screening at the end of the year and, and pretty much everyone in the industry comes to those screenings they take them very seriously and my film was one of the films screened and the next day i got a call from everyone in hollywood and ended up directly because of that within a few weeks i had an agent at icm 
I had a three-picture deal with Ivan Reitman, uh, who, of course, did Ghostbusters and Stripes and Meatballs mm -hmm. uh, to write and direct three comedies for him. And I had my own office on the Columbia lot, and I was still a student at USC while all of this was happening. Nice. So you were writing comedies for this guy? Uh, yes, I wrote one comedy for him. And in the process of that, I had written in a screenwriting class at USC. One of the assignments was you had to write a feature screenplay. So the first feature screenplay I ever attempted to write was uh, a horror film, which I did not know a lot about horror films because I was not a big fan of them. But when I had lived in Alameda, up in the Bay Area, I lived in a house, which had, uh, an apartment. It had been a house, a Victorian home that had been converted into like eight apartments. Mm -hmm. And I had a little party and a guy, one of the guys that came to the party brought a Ouija board with him and everyone was playing with it. And I remember just while I was watching him play with it, thought, well, that'd be an interesting, I mean, I don't, I haven't seen a lot of horror films, but I've never heard of one that's actually based on a Ouija board that could be interesting. Right. And that was as far as I went with it. And then when we had to write a screenplay in the screenwriting class, I thought, well, what am I going to write about? And I remembered the Ouija board, and I got some books and did some research and found out there was, like, all sorts of interesting stuff, you know, progressive entrapment and possession and opening portals and all that stuff. And I thought, ah, I think I could do something with this. And I wrote that. A friend of mine in film school had left uh, to uh, go work for a commodities broker and the broker just happened to mention to him that he was getting tired of commodities and maybe wanted to get into the film biz and my friend said I read a script a friend of mine wrote the film school that I think would be perfect and uh, the rest as they say is history the guy read it liked it raised the money and then while I was still in film school and still working on the uh, writing for Ivan Reitman um, they called and said we raised the money come make Ouija so I left film school four units short of my master's degree and uh, told Ivan, adios, I'm going to movie. And uh, went off and made my first film, which later got retitled Witchboard. That's kind of interesting. You weren't into horror films. You didn't like horror films, but you've done a lot of work. Well, I like, I like uh, this. I'm not saying I didn't like horror films. I just wasn't a big fanatic. Um, you know, I like Star Trek. I watched it when I was a kid, but I didn't wear the uniform, and I right. couldn't give you details about episode 3.9 or anything. <laughs> and I liked the mate. I liked the big horror films. I, I seen like Jaws and uh, The Exorcist, mm -hmm. and I liked them very much. But things like Halloween, Friday the Thirteenth, uh, Evil Dead, really hadn't seen any of those. I had seen the big films, but I just wasn't really interested in seeing the small budget little horror films and didn't actually start watching those until after I'd made Witchboard. And uh, even, I believe, Night of the Demons. I, I remember I saw when we made Witchboard and we had cut it, but it hadn't been released yet. I was worried that it was, because I didn't know that much about horror, I was afraid it wasn't going to be scary enough. And I, uh, by then, I think the original Nightmare on Elm Street was out on, on not DVD, VHS. Mm -hmm. um, and I rented it. And I remember watching it with my uh, then girlfriend, now my wife. And we were watching it. And I was sitting on the floor in front of the TV studying it. And she was sitting on the couch behind me. And we were watching about halfway through. And I said, I think I'm okay because this film feels about as scary as mine. And this one doesn't seem that scary. So I think I'm, you know, because mine didn't seem scary to me at all. I said, this one doesn't seem that scary. And she goes, you don't think this is scary? <laughs> it's all bundled up on the couch with her knees to her chin. <laughs> and, I re and I said, you do? And she said, yeah. And I said, okay, then I'm in good shape. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't even graduate USC before you started on Witchboard. No, I left USC to go make Witchboard. Wow. Uh, how long did it take to make that film? Uh, to actually uh, shoot it, you mean? Yeah. I believe it was a it was a six day or a five uh, it was either a six five day weeks or five six day weeks I can't remember now it was so long ago but it was a thirty day shoot. So that came out in nineteen 
80. Uh, March, I believe, of 87. Okay. And then it was a couple years later that you released Night of the Demons. Um, did you go back to USC during that time? or? Uh, no, actually. I um, What was I doing at that time? Uh, probably looking for employment. <laughs> 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 I, think I, was, I think I was starving and uh, <laughs> looking for employment. I think I might have been an assistant editor at National Geographic for a little while at that time. Or, no, actually, that might have been before I did which I can't remember, you know what, I can't remember, it was so long ago, but uh, I do remember that Todd Allen and I, who was the, who was the star of Witchboard, talking about, because it took, it took uh, Witchboard about a year and a half to uh, come out. Okay. And after we did it, so the point was, you know, and we were talking on the phone, because it's like, you know, you figure your life should be different now, because you've done a feature film, but until it gets released, only you and the people that worked on it know you've done a feature film. Right. So uh, I was actually, he had, he had just sold his car so he could pay his rent that month, and I was getting ready to do that when I got offered Night of the Demons. Uh, so I did not have to sell my car to pay my rent. Uh, oh, you know what, to answer your question, though, now that I think of it, um, we started shooting Night of the Demons in 87. So while Witchboard was coming out to theaters, I was in the process of uh, uh, prepping Night of the Demons. Okay. Now, which then came out a year later. Okay. Uh, it came out in 89. Yep. Um, which board did pretty well at the theaters, didn't it? Yeah, yeah, it did really well. I mean, it, it got a it got a 1100 theater release, national release. It opened as the fifth highest grossing film of the week, you know, up against like, you know, Lethal Weapon and, right. and other big studio films. We were number five. Um, and then it sold a just a ton of video cassettes and then when HBO premiered it on HBO it was their top rated film of that week beating all the other films they showed plus their own original programming we were like the which word was the top rater for the week well that had to be pretty exciting yeah you know I, I think I was too young and stupid to realize how, uh, <laughs> how incredible that was I just kind of took it all for granted back then so, <laughs> which board comes out, and you're already prepping for Night of the Demons. So that probably had a little bit of drive behind that film, uh, with your name behind it already, right? Um, you would think so, but it had. But which board? When we were like when we were casting Night of the Demons, which board wasn't out yet, right? And because the script was so vulgar and foul mouthed, and we were casting in the middle of television pilot season. We were having a really hard time because not only, I mean, we weren't looking for named people. We were going with unknowns, but all the big studios who had, who had, you know, they have like their A tier, the people they think are going to be stars. Mm -hmm. So they're very protective of them. So when we did Witchboard, the script was very character. It was, even though it was a horror film, it was a character driven. Also, I had, my name had a lot of clout at the time because um, my film, my comedy, Book of Joe, had just been a, you know, a big smash hit, and everyone in the studio, everyone in, at, at every studio had seen it, knew about it, and I had a lot of buzz behind me. So ICM, William Morris, uh, uh, UTA, all the big agencies were sending the people that, you know, their Tawny Katane and people like that caliber to us that they thought were, you know, we're still unknown, but we're going to be stars. Right. Whereas when we were doing Night of the Demons, if they had someone they thought had a chance of being, uh, having a career, they didn't want them in Night of the Demons. <laughs> you know, so we, they'd come in and read for us, and then we'd say, yeah, we like him or we like her, and they'd say, no. <laughs> uh, no, they're going to pass. So it was really tough to cast it. Actually, I, I, from what I understand, Night of the Demons 2 was much easier to cast because by then Night of the Demons 1 had been a hit. Right. So, but yeah, so uh, we were still unknowns because Witchboard wasn't out during the casting stage. It came out while we were just about to start shooting. Now, did you write Night of the Demons or were you just the director on that project? No, I, just, I was just the director on that. Okay. Uh, a guy named Joe Augustin wrote, was the writer and the producer on Night of the Demons. That's still one of my best favorite horror movies from the eighties. Yeah, no, it's a it, it you know it surprisingly was a huge. Joe always believed it would be. I was I was skeptical. I was actually I mean I did my best. You know I believe that you know whether or not you think it's going to be good, you still do everything you can. 
Um, but after we shot it and made it, and I, you know, I thought, oh God, I better go out and find another job because when this hits theaters, no one will hire me. So, you know, what do I know? Then it comes out, and Variety just gives it this, you know, big fat rave review. So, you know, <laughs> so I was pleasantly surprised, and you know, and it's become this big cult favorite now. Yeah, I don't think I actually ever saw it at the theater. My girlfriend at the time wanted to rent it and i was a little skeptical but then once we watched it we went out and bought it and i think she ended up with it because <laughs> i don't have it anymore <laughs> <clears throat> which brings me to the next question you know Witchboard and night of the demons did amazingly well both in theaters and v on a vhs yes. now, is there anywhere that our listeners can pick up copies of these films on dvd um well they they did finally come out on dvd both of them were released by anchor bay uh, maybe five years ago. Okay. Um, I don't know if they're still printing them or if they're out of print now, but I would assume that you can find them on eBay or Amazon still, even if they're used now. But, but yeah, definitely, they're both on DVD. And Anchor Bay did a really nice job. They went back and got all the trailers. They got the theatrical trailers plus the TV trailers because since this was playing in theaters, the trailers not only ran in the theaters, but they actually, you know, got advertised on television like big studio films. So they, they have the TV spots. Um, we actually shot a bunch of behind the scenes footage when we made Witchboard. You know, that was back before they did extras on, you know, DVDs didn't even exist. We just happened to do it for the heck of it. I guess because me and the producer and uh, all, all of us came from film school and we were just used to always running around with camera shooting stuff. So we have, so they ended up putting a lot of that footage on the uh, DVD extras for Witchboard. And then they found Linnea at a convention or something and did like a 14, 15 minute interview with her about Night of the Demons that's on, is, is you know, put on the uh, DVD as an extra on that. So Anchor Bay did a really nice job with both films. They brought me and the, the producers in and had us do commentary tracks on both of them as well. Wow, that's nice. Yeah, it was fun. It was really fun to sit with those guys who I probably hadn't seen Jeff and Walter in a couple of years at that point. And I definitely hadn't seen either of the films in quite a few years. And to sit there with them and then watch the films again and then just reminisce and talk about stuff. And they would, you know, and I would talk about stuff I went through on the set that they had never been aware of. And they would talk about stuff they went through uh, behind the scenes or on the business aspect that I wasn't aware of. And mm -hmm. It was funny that we were still getting new information from each other you know, <laughs> 25 years later. <laughs> so let's jump ahead to uh, 2007. Just a couple years ago, uh, you released a film called Brain Dead. Uh huh. Now that ran in the festival circuit for a while, and it was getting some pretty good buzz about it. Um, what's yeah, we got great buzz. We got uh, we won. We won five festivals as Best Picture, and won at another five festival won Best Special Effects. Okay. And um, and we had a limited theatrical release, and uh, it's still actually playing a few more cities theatrically. And then um, we'll be coming out on DVD here in the states probably uh, later this year or early next year. It's already on DVD in some other countries like uh, Hong Kong and uh, Japan and um, I don't know uh, where else Germany I guess those are the big markets it's in right now that you could get a DVD there so if our but, listeners aren't familiar with Brain Dead, uh, what can you tell us about that movie um, it was written by another friend of mine from film school who actually um, is a comedy writer he wrote like for the old Bruce Willis show Moonlighting mm -hmm. and so he wrote this script that the characters are all really funny with funny dialogue and it was a horror script because we had decided we wanted to one, a bunch of us were sitting around me and other film school friends were sitting around and we were talking about how it was you know we were living the dream making these big real movies but how we kind of missed that guerrilla filmmaking camaraderie that we had in film school and so we said we should form a company and make a little film for very little money and basically do it that way again and so he said, Dale, you, you can you write the script. So he wrote, and we decided it should be a horror film, uh, since it was going to be a small film. And he wrote a really funny, you know, the script is really funny as far as the characters. 
but it was originally a giant spider, and we said, well, we can't afford to do that on this budget. So I came up with the idea, we'll turn them into zombies. You know, instead of the people being trapped in a cabin by a giant spider, it'll be zombies. And so it's like basically like Friends or Cheers with zombies. <laughs> so it's really witty dialogue, but then really good, cool, gory, gross kills and lots of gratuitous female nudity. <laughs> yep. And it's, it's kind of got a little different take on the zombie thing. They become zombies in a different way. Yeah, they aren't really... Uh, it's funny, you know, it's like George Romero made the film that became the Bible for zombies and never called them zombies, never used the word zombie in the mm-hmm. film, and himself never thought of them as zombies, just as reanimated dead. Whereas our characters completely, totally call these things zombies, but we show and explain that they really aren't. <laughs> but that's what our guys call them, because they look like the walking dead, so they just keep referring to them as zombies. Yeah, I've, I've actually had a chance to check out that film a couple times, and it's a great movie. So when it comes out on DVD um, later this year or early next year, I strongly urge you to get out there and pick it up. Um, I urge you to do the same. <laughs> <laughs> now, you've done a lot of films. You've done a couple films outside of the horror genre, including Peacemaker and Demolition University. Right, which were action or science fiction. Right, and then last year, in 2008, you directed the film Bigfoot, now this takes you away the, from takes you away from the horror genre, and it's a truly a family film. Well, I've been wanting to do one for a long time. I really wanted to do one like twenty years ago when my kids were little. Mm-hmm. I said, you know, so now. But there's a lot of people. Uh, my wife's side of the family is huge. It's like you know, I always say I married into the King family uh, <laughs> or, or the Osmonds or something. So um, there's still a lot of nieces and nephews that are younger. So I just wanted to make something that they could all see. So when the opportunity came up, I you know I, I jumped at it. Yeah, absolutely, I would love to do this. I would love to make something that you know all the kids could actually watch. And but I came home and told my wife. I said, you know, it's funny. I finally get to do a family film, and I'm still dealing on a daily basis with a big giant animatronic monster. <laughs> <laughs> so I you know I uh, I couldn't get away from that regardless. <laughs> So, I'm still dealing with the big special effects and uh, makeup effects, even on a family film. Now, Bigfoot in that movie, that's animatronics there? Um, yeah, the, I mean, obviously it's a guy in a suit, but the face and all is completely animatronic. Now, is that the same suit from uh, Harry and the Hendersons? No, no, it was completely built for really? this film. Yeah, but the, but the producers wanted it to resemble a Harry and the Henderson monster, and actually the, uh, the guy who built the suit, you know, wanted to go really drastically different, and uh, that was the compromise they came up with. So, so it, it has similarities to the Harry, but it's, it's different enough that, uh, that you know, it's not, it's not exactly looking like Harry. Uh, I actually wasn't involved with any of that because it had a, there was a, another director attached to the film at first who got sick and had to bow out like two weeks before production. So I was hired to come in and take over. So at that point, the film was pretty well already cast and the uh, and the monster uh, the uh, Bigfoot had already been made. Okay. By uh, funny enough, by Kevin Brennan, who I'd worked with one other time on another film where the director had been fired and I'd been brought in to replace him. <laughs> so I worked with Kevin twice on films that he was actually hired on before I was. <laughs> <laughs> so Bigfoot's out on DVD right now? Yes, it came out uh, earlier this month. And uh, where can people get a copy of that? Um, I believe Walmart just has a ton of them. And again, you can you know find it on Amazon.com. Right. And it uh, stars the lovely Angie... Uh, uh, Angie Everhart and uh, she was an absolute doll to work with it's a fun little film I think you know, if you have kids the kids will definitely like it excellent so you've done a little bit of everything throughout your whole career and you're pretty much going well yeah f- yeah it's funny that you know that I'm professionally uh, considered the horror director but after I you know when I did my undergraduate film that won the Emmy Around campus, I was, you know, Kevin, the big dramatic director, because I'd done this heavy drama mm-hmm. that had won an Emmy. And then after I did Book of Joe, I was Kevin, the comedy director. <laughs> <laughs> and when I was first going out uh, 
and meeting with agents and studio heads and all, everything they pitched me uh, to do was, you know, oh yeah, you you know, may, would you be interested in doing Meatballs 4 or Animal House 12 or whatever, everything they pitched me was a comedy. And then the first film I happened to make professionally was Witchboard, which probably wouldn't have made me a horror director except that it was, su it was such a big hit that suddenly I was the horror guy. Right. The guy who had maybe seen 20 horror films his entire life was suddenly the horror director. <laughs> so you've made all these great films, and now you're kind of going full circle. Um, you're involved with the remake of Night of the Demons, correct? Uh, yeah, I'm one of the producers, and my company, um, Prodigy Entertainment, mm -hmm. was uh, co-produced it with Seven Arts, and actually my partner Greg McKay and I were the ones who... Uh, put the deal together. We got the rights from the original uh, production uh, company, uh, Blue Rider Pictures, and then uh, once we had secured the rights, we, cont we, w we uh, contacted Seven Arts, and they were interested, so we worked out a deal and, and got the thing made. It's already filmed? Oh yeah, it's filmed, it's, uh, it's in post. It actually, uh, we premiered it at a film festival in England, uh, a uh, couple of months ago. Really? Uh, Hopefully, it's uh, it's coming out. To, it's coming to theaters in February, or at least that's what I've been told. <laughs> that's excellent. Um, who's on the cast of the remake? Um, Shannon Elizabeth plays Angela. Mm -hmm. um, Monica Kina is our heroine, and, along with Dior Bard and. Uh, oh man, I should have an IMDb page in front of me. Uh, Bobby C. Luther. And uh, Edward Furlong, and lots of other talent. Oh, and we got uh, other talented actors as well as uh, cameos from Linnea Quigley and uh, Tiffany Shepherds. Nice, nice. Yeah, yeah. No, we have a, the whole cast is really strong. Really, uh, another kid named Michael Beach who uh, uh, really good, and uh, M Michael Copen who I believe was a Power Ranger at one time. Oh, really? <laughs> and, uh, is also just, uh, you know, they all did a great job. It was really, really a good, strong cast. Now, there's a lot of remakes being done out there. Um, uh -huh. And you worked as a producer on this one, correct? Yes, I was one of the producers. Did yeah. you have a lot of uh, creative input for the film? Uh, well, actually, I was not the on the. My partner was the one who was on the set day to day. He was the one that dealt with the day to day production. I was involved with the writers while they were writing the script, and then I, um, you know, I, I gave notes to the director during the rough cut stage. Mm -hmm. But uh, no, I did not have a ton of creative input, and I because I was off actually during. It just happened that way. We didn't plan it that way, but it just happened that. Big, uh, Bigfoot went into production the exact same time as uh, um, Night of the Demons, so okay. we were actually, they were both being shot at the same time, so I could not be on the set for Night of the Demons because I had already committed to direct Bigfoot. This is obviously done with a bigger budget than the original Night of the Demons, correct? Oh yeah, quite a bit bigger. <laughs> um, do you think that I think helps? The, uh, I think just the cast budget was more than the entire budget <laughs> of the original. <laughs> Do you think uh, the bigger budget actually helps or hinders um, getting across the original story? Um, well, one, it's not the original story per se. You know, there are a lot of changes mm -hmm. uh, to it. But I think, I think, I don't know that money matters if, if, if the film is done well. Right. There's some nice stuff in there that we couldn't have afforded to do on the first one, but we still managed to pull off some really great shots in the first one with you no know, money that we don't have in the second one. So I think, I think it goes back and forth. You know, it's different directorial styles and different houses and different uh, locations. But yes, absolutely, I think having more money helped because you could get some more big shots that we couldn't have gotten with the original budget. But does it mean that the uh, you kind of lose that grittiness that you had? Yeah, sure. I mean, the Texas Chainsaw remake looks a lot better than the original Texas Chainsaw, but there's a grittiness to the original that isn't there in the slick, polished, big-budget remake. Exactly. Well, I'm interested to see this, because like I said, it's one of my number one favorite horror films from the 80s. 
Well, and hopefully you'll uh, you'll count the remake as your new number one, or at least your number two. <laughs> and hopefully I'll be able to see it in theaters very soon. Yeah, yeah, I hope so too. <laughs> You're also involved with the remake of Witchboard, correct? Yes, we are, again, my partner and I obtained the rights to Witchboard, and we're out now uh, trying to put that whole package together, like we did with Night of the Demons. So you're basically just setting up, you're prepping for it right now. Uh, well, yeah, we're in the very early stages. We're still seeking, you know, we're still putting the financing together mm-hmm. and looking for uh, possibly having a pre-sale deal with a distributor or having it set up with a studio. So we're in the early stages. So that's, that's all going through uh, Prodigy Entertainment, your company, right? Yes, yes. Right now, Prodigy Entertainment is the only one involved with Witchboard, yeah. Okay, Kevin. Um, you've done a lot of great work in the past. It sounds like you well, got I some great it. stuff coming up in the future. Um, if people want to find out more about the film, about you, about what's going on with your company, um, is there a website that they can go to? We have a website right now, uh, www.tennybrothers, all one word, tennybrothers.com. Um they can kind of look stuff up. Unfortunately, it hasn't been updated for a long time because we're planning. We kind of let it go while we're setting up a new Prodigy website, which is not up yet. So, mm-hmm. you know, keep checking back for that. But in the meantime, um, you can at least uh, go to Kenny Brothers and uh, you can contact us uh, or contact the uh, fan site, and then and, you know, they can always forward stuff to us if it's stuff that should be forwarded to us. Okay, that's tennybrothers.com. That's spelled T E N N E Y brothers.com. That's it. Okay, is there anything else you'd like to add tonight? Um, no, we're just, uh, you know, we'll probably be screening. Uh, oh, I know what, you know, if you live in the LA area. Okay. Um, the uh, New Beverly Cinema on uh, Halloween night is going to be screening a 35 millimeter print of Night of the Demons, the original. Excellent. I'm sure so, we'll be uh, talking with uh, Ray McDermott about that next week. He's been keeping us go. updated and, on it. And, uh, and, uh, and hopefully there will be a brain dead screening somewhere up in the Bay Area on Halloween of brain dead. So, Excellent. Uh, those are, those are, that, that's one we're still trying to work out. So uh, if you live in Northern California, you can go maybe we're hope, we're hoping to have a theater for you to go see brain dead in and if you live in southern california we definitely have a theater you can go see night of the demons excellent well kevin keep up all the good work and we'd like to thank you for stepping into the graveyard with us this week my pleasure all right kevin you have a good night you too now as we close down the graveyard i'd like to remind you as you exit please lock the gate behind you We wouldn't want anyone to get out. Until next time. The Graveyard Show podcast is a proud sponsor of the 2009 Viscera Film Festival, which celebrates and promotes progressive women filmmakers in the horror genre. Viscera is now accepting films in two categories, women-directed slash produced films and women-only productions. Submissions are open until December 31st, 2009. To find out more about the Viscera Film Festival, go to thechainsawmafia.com slash viscera for details. Good evening, friends of the undead. This is the Deacon of Darkness, the posthumous pimp freak show. And I am the diva of dismemberment, mistress of the blade, June the Meat Cleaver. Myself, along with the Harlots of Horror, host the online video podcast, Bordello of Horror. Check out all the twisted fun with featured films, news, interviews, reviews, and more. I personally dare you to step into the Bordello at MadisonHorror.com. That's MadisonHorror.com? Madison Horror. Hurry, hurry, step right up. The most amazing tales appear before your very eyes. Gathered from the four corners of Earth and brought here to you at 19 Nocturne Boulevard. See the famous man-eating book of Sumatra. (laughs) Or a phantom direct from merry old England. Or aliens from beyond the stars. 
even such as these cannot withstand our platinum death ray. Yes, our platinum death ray! All these and more spread out before you. And all we ask is a moment of your time. Spin the wheel. wheel. And make a chance. Try your luck. www.19nocturneboulevard.net Last Doorway Show features interviews, news, conventions, and independent horror films. Hosted by Miss Misery. Follow her journey through the horror genre as we discover the inner workings of the horror world. Visit thelastdoorwayshow.com. nature of this program, listener discretion is advised. Choose from Chainsaw Dismemberment, Nightmare 8, da da da, satisfy your sickest fantasy. It's a trick. Get a nice. Hi, I'm Jackie, wanna play? Yeah, they're dead, they're all messed up. Everything. As an elf. <laughs> when there's no more room in hell. The dead will walk here. We all go a little mad sometimes. Haven't you? Destroy the brain. St. Louis's only horror and cult movie podcast since 2007. Visit us at destroythebrainonline.com.